Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening. Whatever time you're watching our service today, welcome. Today we celebrate Palm Sunday, the beginning of Holy Week, Jesus' entrance into Jerusalem. But before that, we begin our service today with a few announcements. During Holy Week, there'll be a service each night shared with Ferry Hill Church. Beginning tonight, Sunday at 7pm, you can join these services via the Zoom links on our church website. You can also simply watch what's happening via the church's YouTube channel and you'll find the links for these on our website. On Wednesday night we have no virtual vestry this week as we will be having our Holy Week service. On the church webpage you'll also find links to prayers and readings and other resources. These are for your own personal times and thoughts of faith and there'll also be some stuff on there for children as well. Please share these links as you wish. We're trying to keep in touch with all of our members through this time. Many of them are not online and have no access to these services. The Kirk Session has agreed to keep in touch with everyone by regular phone calls. If you can help in any way with these, then please get in touch with our session clerk, Sheila Johnson. Finally, today, can I thank those who've assisted in these services so far. Alison Stewart, who's read for the last couple of weeks and who continues to help with filming each week. And this week, can I also offer thanks to Bill Manclark, our church organist, who has provided some music for the service today, and to Andrew Johnson, who leads our reading this week. And now, let's draw close to God as we join together in worship. Our call to worship today comes in the form of this video. O Father God, you are the King of kings and the Lord of lords, enthroned in splendour. You are the King of glory, yet in love you entered our world to be limited by time and space. You shared our humanity, experienced our highs and lows, the joys and the sorrows of living. You lived and died among us all so that we might share in the joy of your eternal kingdom. No wonder the people praised you. No wonder they cried Hosanna. And we join the glad and joyful praise. We bring our love and our loyalty as we worship today. We sing your glory, for you are our saviour and our hope, and we offer our praise and devotion. Loving God, like the people who greeted Jesus with shouts of joy and celebration, but then cried crucify him a few days later. We too are fickle followers. In praise we profess you our Lord and our God. In worship we declare our love. But quickly that praise evaporates in the cold hard reality of the world around us. How often do we deny Christ with our words and our actions and our thoughts? 
Today we confess that our mouths which praise you also often deny and defy you. So help us, Lord, to recognise ourselves in need of a saviour, our hearts in need of cleansing. Bring to us the challenge and the courage to lay our lives at your feet, trusting you to forgive what is sinful and heal what is broken. Lead us as your forgiven people to the way of Christ, in order that we too might be willing to take up our cross and follow wherever you lead. Lord God, as we worship, quiet the voices within us so that only your voice sounds out. Speak to us through the power and the presence of your Holy Spirit. Shape and mould us into your people. In Jesus' name we offer these prayers, and in the Saviour's name we say together the words of our Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever. Amen. The Gospel reading today is taken from the Gospel according to Matthew, chapter 21, reading from verses 1 to 11. Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem. When they had come near Jerusalem and had reached Bethage, at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village ahead of you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, just say this, The Lord needs them, and he will send them immediately. This took place to fulfil what had been spoken through the prophet, saying, Tell the daughter of Zion, Look, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey, and on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and put their cloaks on them and he sat on them. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and that followed were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. When he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was in turmoil, asking, Who is this? The crowds were saying, This is the prophet Jesus, from Nazareth in Galilee. Amen. Our hymn today is hymn 364, All glory, Lord, and honour to thee, Redeemer King. We sing verses 1, 3, and 4, and the words will appear on the screen as well.
Let us pray. Heavenly Father, still our hearts and minds. Drive out all which distracts from your word. Speak to us now through your servant in the power of your Holy Spirit. And may this meditation be acceptable in your sight. Dear Lord, we pray. Amen. On Thursday night, thousands of people across the nation came out of their houses at 8pm to clap for frontline workers. Those carrying out their jobs at a time of national crisis and lockdown. As with the previous Thursday night, the sound of applause filled the air and on every street people expressed their thanks and their praise in this most powerful of gestures. I was busy working on today's sermon at the time and I could not help but draw a parallel between the actions we all shared in on Thursday night and the crowds celebrating Jesus' entry into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday. The intention in both cases is the same, to praise. But behind all of that, there is also a question. As we think about the service given by those working on the front line today, we ask ourselves, how far would I go to help someone else? During this COVID-19 pandemic, we've seen people be incredibly brave in the way that they care for others. Not just those who work on the front line, but also those who are willing to go shopping for at-risk neighbours, family and friends. For those willing to work in food banks. For those who go on delivering to our doors. For those folk volunteering to help in order that community services can carry on, even right down to the simple little acts of kindness that in the grand scheme of things go unnoticed, except by those who receive them. What would you do to help someone else? The crowd who gather on Palm Sunday, they also are taking a risk and making a statement. They're also making their declaration of faith and putting themselves in danger. First of all, they lay their cloaks on the dirty earth for Jesus and the donkey to walk across. They do so as an act of praise. But for most of them, that would have been their only cloak. Their action costs them physically. But Jesus was also a person who caused people to choose sides. There were those who would praise him, but there were also those who saw him as a danger and a threat. And those people were powerful people. And they noticed the people who praised Jesus as he entered Jerusalem. In fact, they told Jesus to silence the crowds, but Jesus would not. They take a risk in order to praise Jesus. But they're not the only ones taking a risk. Jesus also is taking a risk. For he is making a statement. None of what happens on Palm Sunday happens by accident. Jesus has planned all of this. Last week when we looked at the story of the rising of Lazarus. We saw that Jesus waited two whole days before he went to Mary and Martha. And in that time, Lazarus died. We saw that the reason that Jesus waited was not because he did not care for Lazarus or his sisters, but because he was praying, talking with God. Because Jesus knew that to go to Lazarus, to go to Bethany, to go and to heal in this way, would cause a change in his ministry. It would be the beginning of that road to the cross. And today we read that Jesus had arranged for the donkey beforehand, arranged for it at a place called Bethpage. Bethpage is another name for Bethany. 
so most likely on that visit with Lazarus and Mary and Martha. Jesus made arrangements for the donkey and the foal to be available, leaving behind the code word, the master has need of him. And by his actions on Palm Sunday, Jesus is making a very deliberate statement about who he is. He is acting out prophecy, fulfilling God's promises. In Zechariah 9, we read these words. Rejoice, rejoice, people of Zion. Shout for joy, you people of Jerusalem. Look, your king is coming to you. He comes triumphant and victorious, but humble and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Jesus deliberately acts out that prophecy because it is a prophecy about the Messiah, widely recognised as a prophecy that promises that God would send his son, a king, to save the people. And it's not just that action of riding in that is a fulfilment of prophecy. In the laying down of their cloaks, the people are not just carrying out an action of praise of Jesus. They are also fulfilling a prophecy and an action from the Old Testament. In 2 Kings 9 we read that when Jehu was made king of Israel to replace the evil kings who turned away from God, there are these words. The Lord proclaims, Jehu, I anoint you king of Israel. And at once Jehu's friends and all the people spread their cloaks on the top of the ground for Jehu to stand on. They blew trumpets and they shouted, Jehu is God's king. By their actions, the people are fulfilling Old Testament prophecy. And it doesn't just stop there. The weaving of the palm branches is not an accident. It's not just a spontaneous action. Generations before, pagans had invaded the land of Israel, intent on wiping out the Jewish people. They'd taken Jerusalem, the holy city, and they'd entered the temple and they'd defiled it. They'd offer pig sacrifices to foreign deities, thinking that this would destroy the Jewish faith. But it didn't. Instead, it galvanized the people into action. They revolted against the invaders and led by someone called Judas Maccabees, they fought against their enemies and defeated them. And the story is told at the end of that conflict, how Judas Maccabees rode into Jerusalem and all the people gathered and weaved palm branches before him and proclaimed him their king. And Judas Maccabees went to the temple and cleansed it. All of the actions of Palm Sunday point to something greater. They point to Jesus' true identity as the Messiah, the one sent from God to save his people. I have a friend who was a Navy chaplain. He was serving on one of the ships that went to the Falklands during the Falklands War. He held services every day and the nearer the ship got to the Falklands, the more people came along to his services. At times of national disaster, in the past people have often turned to religion. During the world wars, the church is filled as people wrestled with those big questions. Why is this happening? How can we survive this? What is my life worth? In such circumstances, people always look beyond themselves and often cry out for help. That's what God's people were doing in Jesus' day. The cry Hosanna 
literally means save us. In Jesus' day, the occupation of the Romans, the weakness of the faith, the brokenness of so many people, the terrible conditions that they lived in, led to a cry from God's people, save us, Lord, save us. I'm not so sure that in our day, the churches will once again see a return of many people. The world is perhaps in a different place. But nonetheless, in the face of COVID-19, people are asking those big questions. Why is this happening? How will I survive? What is my life worth? And the thing is, when we cry out to God, when we offer up a prayer, whether we've prayed every day of our lives or we've never prayed before, God always hears our prayers. And in love, God always responds. God doesn't judge us good enough to be heard or bad enough to be ignored. God doesn't wait to answer until we've complied with some set of rules and regulations to meet expectations. When we cry out, God listens. And in love, God responds to our cries. That's the definition of the God of love. But what Palm Sunday does bring to light is a, mis is a mismatch between what people want and what God is doing through Jesus. The people know what they want. They want that mighty king like Jehu or like Judas Maccabees who will save them from the Romans, who will make their nation great again, to be feared and adored by all the nations round about. But Jesus hasn't come to overthrow the Romans. He's come to overthrow evil. Jesus hasn't come to take away their oppressors. He's come to take away all the sin that oppresses all people. He's come not just to save the few who gather that day, but all of humankind. God's response to the people's cry is a response of love, a response of total love just as it is a response of total love today. But like the people in Palm Sunday, we do not always get what we expect when we call out to God. God has something much more loving and much more wonderful in mind for us. The people in Jerusalem may have wanted to be free of the Romans, but God sets them free from sin. They wanted to be great in the eyes of all nations, but God invites them to be his family. They had small expectations, but Jesus came to do so much more than they could ever have dreamed or imagined. The message of Palm Sunday is that God responds to our cries for help. In Jesus, God cuts through every need that we have to get to our hearts. God breaks through every obstacle, every barrier to get right down to what we actually need and there to meet our desperation with his incalculable love. Jesus will not be silenced. He will not come quietly when no one is looking on your terms. He will come into your life and respond to your prayers and answer your need. He will answer your questions. He will touch your living. He will present you with complete and total and wonderful, awe-inspiring love, the love that God has for you. He will offer to change your life in ways that you never imagined possible. He will cut through all the facades of our living and present himself to us simply and honestly as the Son of God who comes to save us, who stands in our place 
when it comes to the punishment for all those times when we have offended God. He will cut through all of our life's rubble, all that we are hopeful of and all that we are struggling with, and present us with himself, the means by which we become the children of God, the way that we are made into the family of God. But beware, when people do not get what they want, they're not always patient to receive what God is offering. The crowd who gathered on Palm Sunday, so quick to praise, so ready to proclaim Jesus their King, when he didn't overthrow the Romans, when he didn't declare himself their King and rise up an army, were very quick to cry, crucify. Crucify him, destroy him. So too today, when people do not get what they want in their prayers, they're quick to turn away from God. And the challenge that lies before us on Palm Sunday is also the challenge to wait on God. Do not let our faith be too small to accept what God offers to us. Do not let our expectations of God be too little to recognize what God can offer to us. Do not let our vision be so blinkered by what we want that we cannot see the hope that God offers to us. Palm Sunday says to us, trust in God in whatever circumstances you find yourself. Trust in God in the midst of the darkest days. Trust in God. Because God has a limitless love for you. And today and in all the days that lie ahead, he will bless you and he will shower his love upon you. So look, look for what God is doing in your life. Look for the light that shines in the darkness. Amen. Lord God, at the start of Holy Week, as we remember all that you gave for us in the life and death and resurrection of Jesus, we offer our thanksgiving. For our faith is built on you, Lord, and not on the things that can be taken away so easily by circumstance. Remind us again and again that no matter what, you are sure in your commitment to us. You are unwavering in your love for us. Lord God, we live in a world much in need today, so hear us as we pray for that world. Father God, as we are restricted in what we can do and must worship in households rather than in church buildings, help us to remember that the church is not closed, for the church is about people, not about buildings. We pray for all with whom we normally worship Sunday by Sunday, all who are part of our church family at South Holborn, but also as sisters and brothers across the city, the nation and the world. Holy God, we pray for those in authority as they grapple with the unexpected. Guide those who are giving the world's leaders knowledge and expertise in these times. Give wisdom and courage to all in leadership. And when this is all over, May we emerge better and more kind communities. Loving God, we remember those who are struggling today, those who are lonely and those who are angry, those who are distressed and those who are at their wits' end, those who are struggling to get through the day and the night, those who need help. We ask that you reveal your care and your comfort to them and grant them peace. Almighty God, we remember all those who are working to keep things going, those working in the NHS and those who support the NHS by their services, those keeping our streets clean and collecting our rubbish, those harvesting, delivering and selling food in our shops, those keeping us secure and our utilities functioning, 
those looking after the children of key workers, those helping care for the elderly and the vulnerable, those delivering the parcels to every door, and all who minister in this difficult time. May they all know your nearness and your care, giving strength in each new day. And Holy God, we remember those who've died, whether from COVID-19 or from other causes. We pray for their families and their friends, especially as they arrange funerals so different from what they've experienced. No words can express the difficulty and the sadness. Comfort them, loving Father, and we pray that they and we might come at last to find peace in your presence. And Father God, we remember our own needs now and the needs of our loved ones. Each of us has those for whom we are worried, those on whom we rely and want to thank. And in the silence now, we name them before you and ask your blessing upon them in our own private and personal prayers. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you everyone for watching this service today. I pray that you will have a blessed and a safe week. Take care in all that lies before you. The blessing at the end of our service today comes from the Celtic Christian tradition as it has done in previous weeks. Father God, in awareness of your presence, Beneath the shadow of your wings, in the closeness of your love, may we abide. Jesus, our Saviour, in the fellowship of your disciples, in the victory of your cross, in the hope of your resurrection, may we abide. Holy Spirit, in the power of your love, in the fullness of your gifts, in the guidance of your wisdom, may we abide. And the blessing of God the Father, Jesus the Son, and the Holy Spirit rest upon you all, today, tomorrow, and forevermore. Amen.